All right, welcome back to Theology in the Raw, John. Uh, I, I just told you offline that I think you are the most requested guest <laughs> on Theology in the Raw. So thanks for coming back on and uh, being willing to give us an update on on what in the world is going on with COVID these days. Yeah, yeah. You're not going to get too much theology, but <laughs> <laughs> maybe COVID uh, in the Yeah, I almost said, well, they don't get that from me anyway, but I, yeah. <laughs> um, well, for those who don't know who you are, just uh, you know, I already read your bio and everything, but just maybe in your own words, explain. You know, what's your what's your nine to five job? What do you do? Sure. Yeah. So I I'm a senior biosafety officer for the University of Chicago. Um, I work out at Argonne National Lab in a high containment laboratory. It's called the Howard T. Ricketts Laboratory. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's 12 in the United States. They're called regional biocontainment labs, and I work in one of them. And our kind of mission is to come up with therapeutics and vaccines for emerging infectious disease. Um, okay. So obviously anthrax, plague, Ebola in the past, but obviously the the, the one on stage now is, is COVID, SARS-2. So, um, so that's what I do. I do a lot of training. I do a lot of um, training with personal protective equipment, risk assessment, um, kind of in the, in, in the high containment world. So we have, it's been in the news a lot now with Wuhan, with um, high containment lab and how they were work with, working with it. So you see a lot of the experts on TV with expertise in high containment, but there's only 12 in the United States, right, mm -hmm. that are regional bio containment labs. There might be some small ones, um, where a lab or two, but we were designed after 9-11 with the anthrax labs, 12 in the U.S., to do this um, high containment lab, high containment work, emerging infectious diseases with, with these high-risk pathogens. So. Yeah. High risk pathogens. Their pathogens are usually um, rated. They call risk assess. Uh, you know, one through four, and yeah. we work uh, two and three risk, risk group pathogens, and we work with a BSL, so a biosafety level three. So you have you have pathogens that are rated one through four. Um, that's how how virulent or um, you know dangerous the pathogens are, and then you have biosafety levels where how do you manage those pathogens and mm -hmm. we're a high containment lab and we're a biosafety level three. So are you, um, what is your lab? Is that similar to, and we could maybe just go to the lab leak stuff that is being in the news now, um, that the lab in Wuhan, is that basically a Wuhan version of what you do? Yeah. The only difference is, so they're a biosafety level four. So oh. they do one through four. Um, so biosafety level four would be something like, uh, I don't know if for reference, maybe like the movie Contagion, where you wear level A suits yeah. um, with supplied air. Um, so, but we're biosafety. The majority of high containment are biosafety level three. In, okay. in the U.S., Galveston, there's one. U.S. Amrit has one. There's one out in Boston. So there's not a lot. Okay. The majority of the regional biocontainment labs are biosafety level three. But yes, Wuhan, that's kind of in the news lately just with this, you know, now they're I think the, the the most phrased verse is lab leak theory. Yeah. Can you explain that? Like, what are your thoughts on that? Is it, is that a yeah. legit theory? Well, is it likely? Is it a hoax or what, what are your thoughts? Yeah. Yeah. So it's evolving a little bit now. I think, <clears throat> I mean, if you remember the audience we talked to, your audience is, we said, we, we, we said early on that, you know, the news were asking, <clears throat> excuse me, the wrong question when they were asking early on, and it got political with Trump, and but they were asking, is it man-made? So the governments, you know, the, the NIH and Fauci came out and said, no, it wasn't man-made, which was really at answering that question, was it man-made? But we said, and because we do this research, is, well, that's not really the right question. The right question was, was there gain-of-function research? Meaning you take a bug, SARS, and then you try, so there's gain of function and loss of function. So basically gain of function is you make a bug more virulent, you know, it's more yeah. transmissible, more dangerous, or you can do stuff where you can m manipulate the genome where you make it less, right? Yeah. So that happens. We have huge oversight here in the U.S. In our RBLs, if we do that stuff, we have, you know, local, state, federal, you know, where we have to go through committees and approval and training and documentation. We're in China, and we said this early on, was it's not transparent, right? They don't have an open society. Um, so I, I, I was a little um, hesitant when the government came out early on and said, nope, we know, we know, we know. We're getting information from China, and it was, it, 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 you know, it's man-made, or it was from the environment. Huh. So now I think we're seeing... 
is that it's possible. I don't know, Preston, if we're ever going to definitively, absolutely know if it was gain of function research, which was you take a bug and then you manipulate it, you know, for whatever reason. And, you know, on one side you say, hey, the, the Chinese are good players and they're doing it for good reasons. And then we call it dual use of research, right? Because there's, there's pros, there's, there's good and there's evil. Right, you can go back to mankind with that. We, man, mankind can be good and they can be evil. Yeah. So we call it dual use research of concern, Dirk. Right. So we don't know where China was. And I'm not going to speculate because the United States has done good stuff with pathogens and we've done evil stuff with pathogens. That's why there's some sort of vaccine. That's why there is some vaccine hesitancy, because in the past, the United States government has done evil stuff with pathogens with african-americans with hispanics we'll get that maybe a little bit later but i think the question is yeah it's possible that it was it was um, from the lab gain of function not man-made but it's still possible it was you know from the environment remember too that um china has (coughs) excuse me yeah yeah get it up (laughs) China has, you know, um, uh, open markets, right? And they repurpose meat. So they don't do that in the first world, but in the third world that they have meat markets and some of the meat comes from nature, but some of the meat comes from these labs where you infect the the animal um, with a pathogen. Let's just say theoretically we're talking about SARS. So they infect the animal with SARS. They do the research. And then in the United States, we incinerate, you know, when we do animal research. I don't want to get into that. But in other countries, that's very valuable meat. So they'll let the disease go through and they're supposed to do proof of principle and testing just to confirm that there's no, you know, pathogen left in the animal. And then they repurpose Hmm. and get chicken or steak. You know, they repurpose meat. So that's still that's that's on the table, too. So so I would say everything's on. Okay, so so the, would you say, and we can move on from this, I'm sure, um, but is there more or less evidence that it came from the lab or the market, or for, from your perspective, is it just like, it could be either one equally, we just don't know, it's not like, how would we end up knowing, or what, like, is there evidence more towards one theory or the other? Um, yeah, I think right now, it's trending that it was something happened in the lab, Okay, you know, that could have been, again you know, good purposes, evil purposes. So what happens regularly in high containment? So you think about firemen, you know, they get burnt and they get smoke inhalation. That's part of their job. When you work in high containment labs, you have needle sticks, right? You have animal bites. Um, And then if you don't have a good occupational health program or a a pro, you know, where you have transparency, like something happens in the lab reporting. Mm -hmm. So it's easy for something to get into the lab and then you get sick and then you go outside and you go into a, a festival and there's thousands of people there. And then you have patient zero on day one and 14 later, 14 days right. later, you have thousands. So, yeah, so I think it's trending there. I don't know if we'll ever know. We would know if if China and I don't know, but I, I guess speculate is that if they were very transparent and let remember, they wouldn't let CDC in early on. They wouldn't let WHO on early on because they wanted to get in to to see some of the origins, what was going on in the lab? What were you yeah. doing? You know, there's even been reports that um, early on, some of the scientists in Wuhan changed the sequencing of, of, uh, of um, the virus that they sent us. So we could look at it to say, hey, was it in the environment or was it in, yeah. you know, a lab? So Fauci came out and said, uh, based on this information, it looks like it was it came from uh, natural origins. Okay. Well, that was based on information that we got from China. So, it, so. <laughs> I, my, my personal feels, I don't think we'll ever know. Yeah. No, well, it's not, it, it's not like the Chinese government's the poster children for brute honesty. Right. I mean, I, I don't, I'm not a politi- no. I'm not a political scientist, but from what I've. Right. Yeah. And that's very fair, but it, it wasn't 50. It wasn't a generation ago where the United States was doing that. Where they yeah, were... let, let me, let me restate that. It, it, it's not, it's not as if. Any government, <laughs> I shouldn't, I shouldn't pick on Chinese government. Like governments aren't known for being just super honest and uh, fair. And anyway, and when do we find out when the government hasn't been transparent after yeah. the fact, right? What, what, it, and would it matter? Like, what if we found out for sure? Yep, lab leak. What, what is? Does that make any difference at this point? 
yeah, at this point, and maybe, what would that... maybe a lessons learned kind of thing. But in regards to the pandemic, like preventing it, stopping it, I guess I don't I don't know. That's a good question. Just because there was a really good vaccine now, because if you knew the actual original, it would, might be easier to patch a vaccine or even therapies. That's really what we're really okay. looking at is just therapies, drugs, chemicals that would would, you know, after okay. you get the disease. So. Um, so I don't know. It's a good question. Let's go to vaccines. Um, there is, uh, I'm vaccinated. So um, I, th th this is, man, you, if you just even ask a question a certain way, people get really upset with the vaccine. So I'm, I'm vaccinated. I'm not uh, anti-vax. Um, uh, but I, I like, there is some vaccine, there's some vaccine hesitancy with this vaccine by people that aren't anti-vaxxers, right? Um now, obviously, if you're anti-vaxxer, you're against the vaccine. But I've seen people who maybe even are vaccinated, but are still like, "Yeah, I'm just, I'm, I am nervous about this." It, it, talk to us about the vaccine. Give us the, a, maybe a quick A to Z. Is there any reason to be hesitant, or why are people hesitant about this vaccine and not uh, maybe other vaccines? Yeah. So there's three. Um, they're not fully approved yet. So we'll get into that a little bit. FDA, but under emergency use authorization, there's the um, uh, Moderna, Pfizer, which are mRNA. Talk a little bit. That, I don't want to get too much into the weeds. But then there's a Johnson and Johnson, which is more of a traditional. It's an adenovirus. So basically, it's like an inactivated virus. Okay. That um, where they take out the you know the parts that are really hazardous, and then they um, they inoculate you to for uh, immune response. So there's three. Um, so the, the two big ones are the the mRNA, Moderna, and Pfizer, and we're probably talking, you know, uh, hundreds of millions of people have been vaccinated with those in the United States, yeah. right? Now, it's new technology, the efficacy and safety um, with the 99, 95% are, is fantastic, right? Um, are just through the roof with safety, with efficacy um, that uh, have been really, really good. Um, there have been some minor issues with, you know, allergies that the people have had, which is consistent with other, with other, uh, um, vaccines. Um, and then the Johnson and Johnson, which, which they put on pause for a while, which is very debatable if they should have. I, I, my opinion is that they, they were, they, they put that on pause and then the vaccine hesitancy, if it was there probably yeah. was greater because they did that right that was because of blood clots right there's i think six yeah, people right yeah. now, now still the numbers uh, of people had blood clots compared to the you know the um, um uh, what's happened in in you know in the general population didn't exceed that but they did that out of abundance of caution yeah but if you go on planes with pregnant women you know that risk would have been higher than johnson and johnson so so i get i, I get the argument hey we're in a pandemic um, we got to do something, but let me just say something in general about vaccines that, and I've been doing this for 15 years and I've trained people for 15 years and point one that I have always trained people is it's risk benefit, right? What's your risk and what's the benefit both to the bug and to the vaccine. So if you are, you know, 50 plus to me, it is a no brainer to get vaccinated. If you are 70 or 65, you know, the older you get, it's just the risk benefit is, right. you know, the quadrants would be in that corner where it it's the benefit far, far, far outweighs um, the risk. Right. Um, that you should get the vaccine. But the, the what we've always trained is if if there's very little risk and very little benefit, mm -hmm. then you know, it's a, it's kind of a personal decision, right? Now we're in a pandemic, so it's not just about you. It's about the people that you're around. Right. Um, so I think for the older population, to me, it's, um, the, the data is there. The numbers have come down. We'll talk about variants maybe in a little bit, yeah. but for, for people that are, you know, if CDC has some great information, they're not perfect, but they have some great information about hospitalization, severe sickness, hospitalization, and deaths by age. And it's almost zero. It's almost zero from like birth to twenty. It's not zero. It's not absolute, but right. they're really it's the exception, right? And then once you start hitting 30, 40, and, and I'm talking, to, you know, obviously if there's comorbidities and stuff like that, that's all that's all in play. 
But once you get to that 60, 70, 80, I mean, the numbers just start, you know, exponentially going up. Right. Yeah. So that's why to me, if you are elderly, there was a thing that came out of Maryland Public Health that uh, 100 people died in June and they were all unvaccinated and all elderly. And I'm thinking, why? We can talk about politics because I've seen it. I'm the people that I'm around um, outside. I mean, I, I kind of two groups, I, university, which is in general a little more uh, liberal Democrat. And then the people around church and um, Christian friends are a little more conservative Republican. Yeah. And I know people that are 70 plus and man, they just aren't getting it. And I'm like, what? You know, so so I'll just let me just stay focused. So but for that, to me, it's just a um, a slam dunk home run to get it elderly. Okay. now some issues that I've had recently is with kids. So I have just so so I have I have three, but they're they're older. I have two that are I have a, a 21 and a 20 year old daughter who are in nursing school. Okay. They both been vaccinated because they, um, even though their risk would pretty be pretty low, they're they're doing um, they're they're in hospitals all the time, yeah. working with elderly people. So that was part of our risk assessment, right? It was not only about you, but about the people that you work with. And my 17 year old son Charlie, so he technically has is it's he's been approved for 17 and above, but I haven't we haven't vaccinated him, just because his risk is low and he's not around. Yeah. Elderly people that haven't been vaccinated, grandma and grandpas so, have been vaccinated. I do have a question oh. about that. So, I, I that argument, make, the argue, what you're saying makes perfect sense, like pre-vaccine. But now, anybody who wants to get vaccinated can walk in to get vaccinated. If they don't, that's their choice. So, if so, it, 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 it's not about you; it's about other people. Now that the vaccine is totally available, if somebody chooses not to, they're saying, "Hey, I'm 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 willing to take that risk." So now you know, teenager affecting an old elderly person. I don't think that, that, that to me, it, it doesn't seem as significant now. The other person cho- is choosing not to get the vaccine. Well, I, is, that, I, is that fair or no? Am I, it, yeah, I think so. Yeah. If, because the elderly have had ample time, anybody that's high risk has had ample time to get a vaccine and you're not absolute, but you're in the high 90%. Of, of not getting hospitalization or severe sickness or death, right? So because the, we've, we have vaccinated and it's been out for almost a year, that someone that is much lower risk, I think that's a fair thing. Now, Joe Rogan got hammered, if you remember, hammered for saying that if you're young, you don't have to get vaccinated. And he got hammered by the media and huh. Fauci came out. <laughs> the only thing that Joe Rogan didn't say is, if he is not around high risk populations, but if he would have said, if you are, if you are 21 and you don't, you, you, the world that you live in doesn't include high risk people, right? Then that is a very fair, objective, risk based, science based decision not to get vaccinated. Yeah, that's that seems but fair to me. Yeah. For, um, so just with the kids, you know, um. So full disclosure. So I, I, um, I, I do some consulting on the side where um, we um, review protocols. So I reviewed the, one of the Moderna, chi- you know, the ch- child vaccination oh. studies that was done locally. So I did that. <clears throat> but, you know, they approved it for, I think, 12 to 16 year olds, uh, both of them. And I was looking at these studies and I was just a little concerned. I just wrote some numbers down. So Right now, so WHO does not recommend kids get vaccinated, 12 to 16. Now, they have a little different prerogative where United CDC is just the United States. WHO is looking at the whole world. So their kind of their, their calculation is, well, we can't waste a, a vaccine on a 16-year-old kid oh. that's low risk. And we got some 80-year-old right. person that's not. So th- their, their calculation is a little bit different. But the United States is recommending it you know, for 12 to 17, and there's a real push to get it. And when people ask me, I say, well, let's look at the, what, what the, the data was. So just let me just throw these out there. So yeah. Pfizer got an emergency approval, and they did 2,200 kids. 1,100 were vac- 11, 1100 got the vaccine, and 1,100 were placebo. 1,100. That N is, is almost statistically zero. So they had a hundred percent efficacy or yeah efficacy 
for the vaccine. So 100% of the kids that had the vaccine did not get it. 98.5% um, of the people that got the placebo, which is saline, did not get it. Oh, wow. So 98.5%. Wow. So 16 kids got it. And in the report, Preston, they didn't even mention if it was severe sickness, hospitalization, or death. So what if these 16 kids that got it were asymptomatic? Mm -hmm. Is that risk to getting a vaccine, even though it's very low to have side effects, there's still side effects for any vaccine. Yeah. You know, in, in Moderna, the four, it's the same thing. They had four, they had 1850 on both the placebo and on the vaccine and four kids got it. So, so four in the placebo group got it and that's 99% wow. effective. Huh. So again, they didn't even report if they were symptomatic, asymptomatic, hospitalization, or death. Is, is that because guess, for a person that age, their immune system is just naturally fighting the thing off? And or, or, like, what, what? Yeah. For some reason, um, and I haven't seen any, you know, kind of consensus on why kids aren't getting it. You know, like, yeah. what is different between usually the most susceptible are young kids with underdeveloped. Right. You know, immune systems and the elderly are uh, immunocompromised. But for some reason, kids, you know, as a Christian, I think, Hey, God's, you know, got something to do with that. But you know, that's, that's, that wouldn't fly in a science class. Right. But I, you know, for some reason, kids aren't getting it. Huh. But in these vet, the, 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 the push for these kids to get vaccinated based on now there's probably a million, couple million kids that have, I, I think I saw something that 25% of kids nationwide have gotten it, which is very low. But if someone were to ask my personal opinion, and people do all the time, I say, "Hey, check with your doctor first of yeah. all. Check with your doctor. What's what's your kid's you know status health care health wise? But based on both those studies, let's round numbers: three thousand kids. They tested. They they made this decision on three thousand kids. Sixteen got it in one, and four got it in the other. Yeah. That's twenty kids that had sugar stuff, you know, yeah. inoculated them. Got it. It's like that to me, I just, yeah. there's people that might be smarter than me, but I don't, that to me, that I don't understand that. And, and so the other side of the risk assessment is this is new technology. Uh, there, obviously there's no long term. We don't know in five years if, you know, it's probably fine, but it is, it is a little riskier than other vaccines that have been around forever. And we kind of know, that's right. The results and everything. So, so I heard I heard a journalist and he got hammered for this, and he's done a ton of re I forget his name, um, uh, but he's done a ton of research on all the vaccines. And he said he he kind of says pretty much what you're saying. He says if you're at risk, I, I would get the vaccine. He said himself, he's like a healthy forty year old. He says, you know, I'm not against getting it, but I'm really healthy. I'm gonna roll the dice a bit. I don't I don't think I'm highly at risk. But then he said. I've got ch children under 20 and he said over my dead body will they get this vaccine and he got hammered for that but I think and, and maybe he said it stronger than maybe he should have or maybe not I don't know but it, it's I, I think he's exactly your point and also because you know yes they could be carrier monkeys to give it to grandma but he says grandma can get vaccinated if she's choosing not to if she watched too much QAnon or whatever and says, i'm not getting to, then it's just kind of her i mean she's it's kind of her choice too you know which is fine it's like hey that's what we're all making those kind of choices um, even a good question people ask me all the time is what about the long-term effects very fair question yeah it's like there's we're seeing long-term effects for covid right so remember we can't have one you can't ask one without the other but right. yeah, people oh, yeah yeah that's good smaller it's used with covid and that's a year in, so we'll see. It's only been a year, yeah. so you, nobody can say the vaccine's only going to be good for this amount of time or natural immunity will only be good for this amount of time because it's only been a year. Well, as right. time goes, those questions will be in light, you know, those will be answered. Okay. But that is a very fair question. The long-term effects of COVID are real. I mean, I have a brother-in-law that is still having, he was healthy, he still is, but he's still having some cognitive hmm. issues. Really? His process wow. is just not right, he said. And that has been reported, you know, yeah. it's, it's, you're, you're seeing more, or just, I mean, that's kind of a consistent thing, not with everybody Yeah, that's in play, but a very fair question is what's the long-term effects. Okay. So if I'm 75 and I, and, and COVID 
to get the vaccine and it adds 10 more years and their side effects five years from now, 10 years from now, hey, risk-based, that was a, still a good question, right? Or good decision. If I'm 17, 15, 12, you know, and um, the government's telling me you got to do this to go to school, and then 10 years later, 20 years later, 30 years later, I, we, you don't know. For anybody yeah. to say that they know definitively huh. that there's going to be no long-term effects, I think is just, it's, it's not right, yeah. you know? Wow, that's so. helpful. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, oh, shoot. What was I going to ask? Vaccines. Well, I want to talk about the Delta variant, but there was something else. Um, well, shoot. Oh, 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 herd immunity or natural immunity or whatever. What's the correct phrase? Is herd immunity yeah. the correct phrase or is that the pop phrase? Yeah, so so that's another sticking point that I have a little issue with with the media narrative is that herd immunity, historic, and I've been training this for 50, so it's not new, yeah. is always been um, the uh, combination of vaccinate, vac vaccinated people and people who have had the disease. So herd immunity, the, the, the percentage is they, you know anywhere between 70 and 85%. So if you watch some of the narrative just about, well, we're not at herd immunity because only 160 million people have been vaccinated. But well, to me, that, that that is not consistent with what we've always said. We've always trained that it's, it's both vaccine and natural immunity. And there has been some fantastic studies out of Israel. It was the biggest ever that was done. And nature just came out with natural immunity. Um, so we'll kind of combine these two things, natural immunity and herd immunity. But they both said that it's possible that if you've had a... a, a uh, um, 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 an infection with, it's been substantial, not asymptomatic, but if you've had it, you may have, um, um, lifetime immunity. Okay. You know, like chickenpox. that's in play. That is definitely in play that if someone has had a, a, you know, a little more severe sickness that they may have immunity for the rest of their life. Time will tell. Okay. But Israel did this study where they wanted to see they wanted to compare the vaccine, the Pfizer vaccine, yeah. and they wanted natural immunity. And and they saw that that Pfizer was fantastic. They were like mid to nineties on um cases, hospitalization, severe sickness, and death. They were all like you know, mid nine mid to high nineties. Natural immunity and all was at either equal to that or a little bit higher. Oh wow. And you don't hear that. Oh. I don't understand why that narrative is just about herd immunity is just about um, um, vaccination. Now, a variant could come and, and throw this all off, right, which we'll talk about in a second. But if you think about, let's just throw general numbers out there. So we got 330 million Americans. We have 160 that have been va fully vaccinated. Um, so write this down. So 160 fully vaccinated. We have 35 million diagnosed cases, and CDC said we have um, five times more people undiagnosed. So that's 35 times five is what? Get my. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, 150, 175, is it 175? That's embarrassing. I hope I didn't but butcher that. <laughs> I don't... So 175, right. So. You have so you if you add those numbers, those are actually greater than the, the population. Now, what is missing is that there's probably been millions and millions of people that have have had, you know, were undiagnosed or diagnosed and got the vaccine. Oh, so okay. we're probably so you're talking pr probably I'd just throw a number, just say 50 million people have either diagnosed, undiagnosed, but then got the vaccine. Wow. So we're right about. 75 80 85 percent of the population that's either been fully vaccinated or has had it right yeah that herd immunity number that is always i hear about 75 to 85 we're right there but that is consistent with they call the wild type strain the original strain the og right yeah <laughs> so what so what what what's thrown in here what's what, what just throws a monkey wrench is is variants Right. So very, I want to I want to get there, but real quick. So I, I've heard again. I love you know. I hear all this stuff, and I have you on the fact check everything I've heard. <laughs> um, I've heard some people say that. I mean, if you've if you have had COVID, um, you 
and I think you just said it like you are more protected from getting like you're you're that's all that's in a sense slightly better than even having getting vaccinated um first of all second of all if you've already had it there's scientifically you don't need to get vaccinated now practically politically whatever would that be correct if you have already had it you recover maybe you're asymptomatic whatever just on a scientific level should you go get vaccinated yeah good question I, this would be like a uh, md your personal personal yeah. physician but what they're seeing right now like the biggest study that was done was is that was done in israel was that it was as good but that is against as good if not better yeah natural immunity both very high but that's with the original strain okay. so oh, okay the, so, the original strain is never going to come back and be like the prominent, you know, variant now. Now it's it's all the new stuff now. So the, so vac the vaccine what? could add more protection against variants, whereas if you just had the original strain, you're not necessarily protected against variants. Is that? That's right. They both okay. could be a little bit better or a little bit worse with a, any variant that comes. The vaccine could be better or natural immunity, or we can get a variant that comes where your natural immunity mean is is not working is is, is really decrease your natural okay. immunity. The one thing that might be a little bit different is the variant because it's engineered in a lab. Um, they try to, you know, it was designed to, to think about variants where your natural immunity ah. just, even though you might get some cross immunity, there could be some variant that comes where natural immunity is just not doing anything. It's unlikely that that would happen just because the COVID they're saying it's not going to change too much. Um, it's going to change a little bit with some of the, you know, with some of the variants and mutations and stuff like that, but it can't, if it changes too much, then it's not going to, it won't be as infectious. Oh, like interesting. That. Okay. Well, let's, let's go to variants then. So uh, maybe just explain what, what a variant even is. And then, um, you know, we have the Delta one that's kind of new. Uh, was there one there? And I'm, I'm going to, yeah. Fact check me please on this. There, there's the UK one right and then the south africa and then something's going on in india i don't know if that's like a variant thing but anyway that's the yeah. extent of my knowledge on it <laughs> well so it can be confusing because there's different you know nomenclatures where who use stuff cdc stuff used you know where it's you know covid 19 hb you know all the different names and stuff like that but basically it's just a mutation so what what viruses do are kind of just wicked awesome as they might say out east is they just adapt and they evolve and they change so i could have you know the original strain um I, I get infected and then what comes out of me is something a little bit different you know and that what just because of the the mutation that happens inside someone is that it can come out and it can infect somebody that might be a little bit more transmissible transmissible a little bit less a little more lethal a little less lethal and that just it just that's what happens um just with viruses. So what you're seeing is you had the original and then you're seeing we're at Delta. There was another one that was Epsilon that's come out. And so you're just going to, this is going to kind of ping pong from the developed to undeveloped where you're going to see this variant come from here and this variant go and then kind of go back and forth. But the main one that we're talking about is Delta, the Delta variant, which is much more transmissible um, than the original. Um, and so basically what that does is if you think about, you know, like a fuse on a bomb, right? So you have you have a beginning of an outbreak and you had the original and you had a fuse that was 20 feet long before there was exponential growth in, in an outbreak. Well, what Delta will do, Delta, because it's more transmissible, it, it, it's going to shorten that fuse. Okay. So from the time it starts spreading, so you start seeing exponential growth, it could start happening a lot quicker. I just, now just yesterday, University of Chicago, which is very, very conservative when it comes to this. We're not mask. I don't have to mask anymore at work. Hmm. Um, but I just read that California is going back. They're going back to masking today. Huh. You know, so because of Delta, because Delta is really starting to increase. The numbers are still relatively low, but they're starting to, you know, it's starting to go from like zero to a thousand or something like that. So. Yeah, so I, I don't know the answer of where it's going. We actually started doing some research on Delta, which is with some you know different chemicals and drugs and stuff like that. But we definitely know it's it's more transmissible in regards to if it, it, it you know if it's more lethal. Um, um, we don't know that yet. Okay. Uh, but this is what's going to be kind of I don't want to say cool, but will be pretty cool to see 
is if you're going to see a huge difference between people that are vaccinated yeah. and unvaccinated. This is like a real time science experiment right so we, here. We don't know if if you've been vaccinated, uh, does that guard against Delta? Or are you saying we just we're not quite sure? We're not quite sure. In the lab, it looks like yes, right? Okay. So they, they'll call it like you do lab studies, but not until you see human subjects, which okay. we all are now. Well, you really see, you know, the proof will be in the pudding, right? We have, most people think that if you've been vaccinated, that uh, with Delta specifically, that you're going to have some sort of protection. Okay. Uh, what we don't know and what we'll find out too is natural immunity. We're going to find out if people that have had okay. natural immunity, what happens with this Delta. But what I'm really going to be interested in is to see um, what if the unvaccinated, because there's still millions of people, you know, um, that that um, right now probably just don't want to get it for whatever reason. Yeah. And we're going to start seeing if that um, what happened in Maryland, 100 deaths, 100 percent unvaccinated, it will start happening, you know, nationwide, which will be really, really unfortunate because people in the third, they're really getting hit hard in Asia and Africa. And that's kind of a first world argument we have, right? Where they don't have those over there in Asia and Africa. But I ain't getting, no, no, no. There's this in there and there's a little bit of this preservative or additive. And meanwhile, what's happening in the third world and we're arguing over, yeah. you know. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so time will tell with it. And I think just because with the incubation period is usually about two weeks. So we're going to see it's starting to tick up. We'll see in two weeks what, what happens. Okay. I guess my, my guess would be it's not going to – we're never going to be – I won't say never. I'd be – it's un, it's unlikely that we're ever going to be at numbers where we were okay. um, last year where, you know, I think 100,000 people were dying. I don't want to um, quote that, but a lot of people were dying, a lot of hospitalizations just because um, – the original strain and vaccine, it's, it'll, you know, we're at 70, 80%. So I don't think we'll ever get to the okay. degree. I don't, you know, no absolutes with a variant that comes and just yeah. kicks our butt. Um, we'll the, uh, so it, uh, the Delta variant, what was the UK and the South Africa? Are those different variants or the same thing or? Yeah, I, I'm not sure how they, if, if it was UK and then they called it the Delta, I'm not really sure about okay. the actual variants, okay. you know, the name, but yeah, different ones. And they're going to kind of ping pong back and forth. You're going to see that, yeah. you know, there's a lot of researchers that I know and that I respect that say the only way out of this is, is people vaccinated worldwide or else it's just going to, it's just going to keep going. Okay. So even though the United States, it looks like we're coming, kind of coming out of the tunnel, the rest of the world, you know, yeah. it's, it, it, interesting now that's that's another argument for everybody getting vaccinated including kids N not just their kind of individual potential affection of other people but it just on a, on a on a community level we could stamp is everybody's vaccinated this thing would just end up fizzling out so right yeah yeah okay. yes yeah i don't know if i mean i don't know what the vaccine rates are in some of us you know third world asia africa you know yeah. Olympics are ha in Japan. I'm kind of shocked. They're really have struggling again now, huh. and they're on down in some places in Europe. And so, from I, yeah. you know, we're, we're still from a pandemic, you know, definition worldwide. We're still in the thick of it, even though I think the U.S. is. I think we're coming out of it, but well, we'll see. What know, happened in uh, what was going on in India? There, there, is it still? I mean, a lot of deaths, right? A huge uptick. Why was yeah. why was that? Is it just people? Yeah. Well. If you just think about some of the controls that, you know, with you know, distancing and masking and, you know, um, they just can't do, you know, um, they can't. I mean, they're all living in general, you know, they're the living situations are much, okay. much different than in the United States. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know. You, uh, you mentioned, well, offline that, uh, well, I'll just ask the question. Have you since I had you on about a year ago, um, actually I think it's like last fall. Have you, have you changed over the last year on your, what you've seen based on your research, your evidence that you've been looking at? Um, what are some yeah, things think, that you said maybe a year ago that you would not say now? Yeah, I was, you know, shocked early on how quick the vaccine rolled out. Okay. You know, I think everybody that I interviewed with or had me on, I said, wow, you know, Trump is really ahead of his skis on how 
quick he thinks he's going to get this vaccine. And he was the president, and he got it done. I mean, he whatever he did, if he did a lot or none, nothing, um, he he uh, um, provided a environment and culture to get it done quick. Mm. And uh, that happened. And I was rough on him with a lot of stuff, but he he mm. he did a good job with that. You know, so that's what I was surprised. I told a lot of people, well, just because I'm in vaccine research, and it takes years to get stuff. Mm you know, through all the different governing agents and regulations and, you know, so he cut a lot of the red tape, you know, um, with funding. And I saw that firsthand. So someone says, Oh, he didn't do anything. I, you know, we saw the funding to come in really quick. Huh. So that, that's one thing. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised how, so I would kind of coin myself an evangel- evangelical Christian but they're one of the people that aren't getting vaccinated. Hmm. It's blacks, Hispanics, and um, evangelical right wing hmm. um, Christians for some reason. And I understand the black and Hispanic. My in laws are Hispanic. They're Mexican. You know, my my dad, my father in laws from Mexico, and he's seen some you know just uh, government. You know, corruption when it comes to that. So I get why that's he- they're, they're hesitant. You is know, that I why get- it's hesitant? Because of the history of people of well, color being. So I that's the lot that to me that makes sense why why African Americans and Hispanics would be hesitant because of pe- even Indians where they use those as human subjects or they oh. told them they were given the medicine and they were given them the you know the the, the infection and you know so there, mm-hmm. we have a history of that right. Oh. So I understand that even though when. It came to your life, but w- usually when you're 60, 70, you're like you're you're dug in. So I understand that. What I don't understand is the the Christian community that it, there's an element that has become so right where it's just like a political Christian thing. Where mm-hmm. and I know some that are great Christians and they serve and they're working in inner city and just doing the mission, but no, uh-uh, I'm not getting there 70 plus And, and it's a political thing to them where it's like, it's almost where there's like an allegiance to this, you know, yeah. part of Christianity that is hard to find in the Bible. Is, but yeah, who, that really shocked me. Who, who on the right is anti vax I mean, the, I mean, Trump got vaccinated. <laughs> He's pretty on the right. Uh, Ben Shapiro is a pretty popular conservative. He's very pro vaccine. He's even pro mask. I mean, he's very libertarian. Do what you want, but it, when no, when masks right. were a big deal, he was av- so. Who am I? I mean, I don't listen to a lot of commentators, especially right wing commentators. But is there somebody on the right that's like? No, I think it's the it's the um, kind of the government conspiracy and okay. Uh, but there's an element into in in that that we're. Uh, don't tell them it's it's my choice. You know they always use the argument. You okay. know I'm pro, I'm pro choice. Well, if you can say that about a woman's body, I can say that about you okay. know me getting vaccinated. And but it's almost sad, you know, especially when we talk about this risk based thing, right? Hey, you're right. 18. Okay, I get it. You're not around elderly people. I get it. But you're 70 plus. Hmm. You know, um, maybe overweight, have compromised immune system, but you're just not getting it. I just don't. Hmm. To me, it's just not a science based, risk based, you know, um, even a Christian ethic, you would probably be able to speak to that more with all the evidence that we have of why a 70 year old just wouldn't want to get it. Like, no, I'm good with that. Maybe that's okay if you want to die and you're not going to hurt anybody else and you just don't want to get it. I get, I guess there's, yeah, but it just kind of shocks me. It, it is, I mean, I, because everything's been so politicized. And there's been a lot of just backtracking and changing of opinions. I, I, I can I can see where somebody would just say, I don't trust anybody anymore. Like I don't I, I don't it's like everything's like I, here here's a thought experiment for you, John. Let's go back in time to uh March or April. What imagine a world where Donald Trump was very much pro masking. What would that world look like in the wake of that? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to predict that anybody who's on the left would be anti-mask. 
<laughs> yeah. I would say because right now it's very it's very much a right left thing, right? Like if you see someone with a mask, you know they're a Democrat nine times out of ten. If you see someone without a mask in a place where they should be masking nine times out of ten, they're going to be Republican. Why? Because it all comes down to right. I mean, t- <laughs> yeah, <laughs> because they- Trump was more anti-mask, especially early on, and everything's so polarized that either you're pro-Trump or anti-Trump. Either you, yeah. you know. But that, but even that alone, like that thought experiment raises the question, how much of mask wearing or not mask wearing is even based on any kind of scientific convictions and how much is based on political allegiance? I'm just going to maybe cynically say it's so much more of the latter on both sides. Well, I do know. So one of the things and I don't want to get into a math debate, but one of the things that I do and not a lot of people do that, but I, I certify filters. That's what one of the one of the my position descriptions. I have photometer. I have an aerosol generator. I can decrease and increase the size of, of aerosols. I can put a piece of piece of material and I can quantitatively tell you how much is getting through a filter. Yeah. Half the people that are on TV, don't they don't know crap, you know, excuse my language, they don't know anything about certifying filters or yeah. respirators, anything like that. They're just making a political statement or this is what I heard. That, that's what I do. That's one of the things. I've told people, come to my lab, bring whatever mask you want, yeah. and you will see, we'll generate some aerosol, whatever type you want. You want a big aerosol, you want small, you want a droplet. We'll put that through your filter and you'll see a reduction. So that that yeah. that is just... To me, it's settled. Now, it doesn't. It's not. Wait, absolute. wait. Sum, summarize your point. You're saying so wearing a mask does reduce the. That's right. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. But what happened, and we talked about this earlier, not to retread it, but we talked about on the left, they said it's absolute. You wear a mask and you're 100% protected. <laughs> and then the people on the right said, masks, they're not. They don't. They don't do anything, you know, yeah. They're political. And Fauci changed his mind and he said <laughs> this and then he said, and I get all that. And that's what all the confusion yeah. is. But that's one of the things that I do yeah. on a daily basis. I certify filters. You know, and those are filters you could just as a material. A mask is a filter. Yeah. You know, so but yeah, it's become politicized and it's just, you know, it's people on both sides, they don't know what they're talking about now and they're it's, it's a political state. Yeah. yeah. So so and maybe I misremembered, but I thought you said before that masks reduce the spread of droplets, but they don't is my, they don't guard against aerosols or is it they they still do reduce the spread of even aerosols or i, I don't know, maybe summarize your view on mask and it no you're right there so droplets yeah mask mask reduce a, you know, at least 50 percent of droplets when mm-hmm. it become when it comes to aerosols much less effective much much less effective but remember we talk about dose too so you get mm-hmm. infected based on dose like how much so obviously the bigger the particle the more dose of covid you have so a droplet is much bigger than an aerosol now an aerosol might you know they, they it, it can get in you know into your your airways and affect it different ways but the main route still is droplets aerosol is still in play no doubt about that masks are not nearly as effective um, at, at, um, but it still reduces. I can put it, I, I can take an aerosol generator, really small, the most penetrate, we'll get a little sciencey now. The most penetrating particle is the one that's 0.3 microns in size. I can take my aerosol generator and I can make it 0.3 microns, which is the most penetrating. Mm-hmm. And I can put it through a filter and, and, and have a, a instrument called a photometer and I can measure it and it reduces. It, it's much less with aerosol. There's no doubt about that. Okay. I think people on the left in general said, Oh, it protects you against everything, and that's not true either. And it's it, the kind of, like when you walk around, or maybe several months ago, and see people wearing masks. Are you like, are they are they on right? Uh, what the cloth mask? What about bandanas? And I remember I was in <laughs> I was in uh, some Mexican food joint a while back, and there's some twenty something girl. I swear she had like a lingerie mask on. <laughs> <laughs> it's like oh it's, she's covered but it's like i can see her teeth like i can see <laughs> no, um like there does it depend does it depend on what kind of mask and how they're wearing it and are you seeing people like yeah they're definitely as long as something's on your face or i mean i'm in indiana so i don't see anybody mask anymore <laughs> <laughs> but in chicago yeah still people are but yeah that that's all in play right and masks are just one tool. So when you take mask and then you do social distancing and you wash your hands, mm. you know, when you do that, it's yeah. kind of a compound effect that decrease your risk. So right. masks just by themselves, yeah. if you are close to a hundred people in itself is, 
going to reduce it a little bit. But when you add these yeah. distance, mask, washing, you know, contact, that all, you take all that stuff, the compound effect is you're decreasing yeah. your risk, yeah. uh, you know, substantially. Not zero. And you could still get it right. with aerosol. You're right. Someone can cough, aerosolize, you can breathe it in. What we still don't know is the dose. So we don't know how much okay. it takes to get and that would all, you know, once we, as they do more and more aerosol studies, that might be answered. But is the CDC um, correct when they, when they said, um, Hey, if you've been vaccinated, the masks, you don't need to wear a mask, um, anymore. Or I don't, I don't know if they said it exactly like that, but yeah, they just, I, 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 your risk, if you've been vaccinated or natural immunity, your risk is really low, right? And wearing a mask would wouldn't do it wouldn't do zero but it you know i'm trying to give an analogy it would it wouldn't do a lot it it would help a little bit right especially if if you were around someone that was symptomatic or let's say i was i i was symptomatic me wearing a mask would really prevent a spread of my droplets to someone that's vaccinated or not vaccinated now the person that's been vaccinated is probably going to be if they do get it I, i know a lot of people that have been not a lot i know a handful of people that have been vaccinated that Got it, but they were very, very um, asymptomatic if, with little sim- or some with little symptoms. So wearing a mask would prevent that. Would prevent a big droplet coming, a big sneeze coming out, and just someone just uh, breathing it in. So it would help a little bit. Okay, okay. Uh, where, where else have you uh, changed your mind on anything, or not changed your mind, but like based on further study? Is there anything else um, that you? No, I think. Um, um, the vaccine I was shocked in, but in regards to the science part of it, I think the origins was something that I w- I've always been on, on the table is that it could, it could have been a lab leak or gain of function. Yeah. Yeah. Um, other than that, um, I think, you know, um, you know, what I've, you know, told the audience or other audience has been pretty right on, but I do think it's because that's what I do. I work in a high containment lab. A lot of the people that are on TV don't work in high containment labs. <laughs> You don't know what gain of function is. Um, they don't know um, what a respirator and a mask is. They don't know how to test these things, so they just kind of spout that out. So, I think one of the advantages is that this is what I, this is actually what I do. It's yeah. not something I know in theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, in the fall, uh, is there any reason why schools shouldn't be fully back in school? I mean, is that? Um, I, th- I think everybody's going back to school in the fall, isn't there? You said California they're going back, but they're going to require masks or. Yeah, I don't, I just heard that this morning. So that could change a little bit, but yeah, I, so my son was in high school and he was, uh, he went, I had him go back hundred percent. They had an option last year, but I think most schools around here are going back a hundred percent. The only caveat would be the union run city of Chicago schools that, that run the show there, which is kind of sad, but um, so interesting to see what, with something I might, um, yeah, I want to get to that, but yeah. So from a risk based science base, yeah. um, you know, a kid should be going back. Even the, the top people are saying, Hey, the, 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 um, side effects of, you know, mental health, all that stuff for kids, they should be going back. Yeah. I mean, in most cases it should be with masks, try to distance a little bit. The kids need to be in school yeah. and that is to me, it's just another slam dunk where, yeah. Unless something changes where the infection rate of kids starts, you know, really climbing, but kids need to be in school. That that's the yeah, the side of the mental side effects. That's something I don't hear as much or I, unfortunately, I feel like I only hear it on the right, maybe that that kind of like what about all the other side effects that you know, yet we have to mitigate of mental health and um cuz that that's really I mean, gosh, uh I agree 100% yeah. and from a from a political perspective, and I try to be pre- really independent when I'm watching, is that I, I don't hear a lot of people on the left talking about mental health with, with kids. And if you think about that that high school age, probably the most vulnerable mental health time of your life is in high school. Now you're going to tell a kid to go on Zoom. I think the ghosting in city of Chicago, CPS, of people not even going on Zoom, it was like 70%, Preston. Wow. You can't have kids let alone in, 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 in families that, you know, have mom and dad and just following up with them. But if you don't have any follow up yeah. way, I think if I was a kid, you know, my dad died young. So it was just my mom, single mom who worked 
And if he told me to sit in front of a computer for eight hours to go to yeah. school, I'd be like, you're yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So yeah, kids need to be in school because in the mental health is huge. We yeah. don't even know the long-term effects of that. Right. 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 Yeah. Well, John, thank you so much for uh, sticking your neck out there. I know probably everything you have said is, you know, uh, debated and, and, you know, people might disagree or whatever, but um, I love having you on because, you, like you said, this is this is what you do. You're not just some person who's read some studies. You're, you're doing the studies. So uh, thanks for being willing to come on. I know you probably got a busy day out there in Chicago. So, um yeah, best luck to you. I'll probably call you in a couple months and say, hey, John, yeah. <laughs> something else flared up. I need to have you back on. <laughs> Let's do it, Preston. I appreciate your time. All right. Take care, man.